Samantha Therese Knight, originally named Samantha Therese O'Meher, graced the world with her presence on March 25, 1977. Her early years were spent in the picturesque locale of Manly, under the care of her parents, Tess Knight and Peter O'Meher, until their separation led her to reside with her mother in the charming suburb of Bronte. By 1986, their lives had transitioned to a modest block of flats on Imperial Avenue in Bondi. Tragically, on August 19, 1986, Samantha vanished without a trace. Despite a fervent search effort, marked by the widespread distribution of her image throughout New South Wales, she was never located. The investigation into her disappearance eventually turned its focus to Guider, who had come under scrutiny from law enforcement due to mounting pressure from Denise Hoffman, co-author of Forever Nine. Hoffman had collaborated with Guider on various Aboriginal sites in Sydney and became concerned after hearing from freelance journalist D. Michelle about Guider's peculiar and obsessive remarks regarding Knight. Although Michelle hesitated to approach the authorities out of loyalty to a friend, Hoffman resolved to take action and conveyed her suspicions to a detective at the Castle Hill Police Station. When questioned, Guider initially claimed to have only encountered Knight a few times. However, it was later revealed that he had assaulted her and two other young girls at a residence on Raglan Street in Manly between 1984 and 1985. Following an extensive investigation, Guider was charged with Knight's murder on February 22, 2001. On June 7, 2001, he entered a guilty plea for manslaughter, asserting that he had inadvertently administered a lethal overdose after drugging her, fearing she would recognize him upon regaining consciousness. On August 28, 2002, Michael Guider received a sentence of 17 years in prison, with a non-parole period of 12 years for the crime of manslaughter, to be served consecutively with his sentence for child sex offenses. The remains of Knight have never been located. Guider exhibited no signs of remorse and claimed to have no recollection of what he did with her body. Over the years, Guider's accounts regarding Knight have been inconsistent. Initially, he professed complete amnesia concerning her whereabouts, Subsequently, he asserted that he had interred her in Cooper Park, situated in the Bellevue Hill suburb of Sydney, only to later claim he had exhumed her and disposed of her remains in a skip at the Royal Sydney Yacht Squadron, where he was employed as a gardener at the time. In March 2003, he informed the authorities that he had buried Knight within the grounds of the Royal Sydney Yacht Squadron. A search conducted on May 15th yielded no results, despite a police sniffer dog indicating a positive reaction to the soil from the area. The dog's handler expressed surprise at the lack of findings, stating that the dog's response was as definitive as possible, leading him to believe a body had indeed been present. Authorities were inclined to believe Guider's latest claims, speculating that Knight's remains might have been inadvertently disturbed during the construction of a car park approximately 18 months after her burial, or that Guider himself may have relocated them upon learning of the impending excavation. Michael Guider was born in Melbourne, Victoria, Australia, and relocated to Sydney with his mother in 1952. His mother endured a tumultuous relationship with an alcoholic army cook, and in 1953, Guider welcomed a younger brother, Tim. Due to their mother's instability, the two boys spent time at Melrose Boys' home. Guider later disclosed to prison psychologists that he had suffered sexual abuse at the hands of his mother and subsequently at the boys' home. In the 1970s, Guider faced charges for various offenses, including setting fire to a shop owned by a woman with whom he had been involved. Guider, once a dedicated gardener at the esteemed Royal North Shore Hospital, cultivated a profound appreciation for Aboriginal culture and the historical sites of Sydney over the years. His passion led him to gain recognition as an amateur authority on the subject, with his insights featured in at least one published work. 
However, his life took a dark turn in December 1995 when he was apprehended for inappropriately touching two young girls, aged seven. The incident came to light when one of the girls confided in her mother, prompting her to alert the authorities. In 1996, Guider faced the consequences of his actions, receiving a 16-year prison sentence with a non-parole period of 10 years for a total of 60 charges involving 11 children. His predatory behavior typically involved babysitting the children of acquaintances and administering the sedative to Mazapam to incapacitate them before engaging in acts of molestation and photography while they slept. In 1999, he was sentenced to an additional six years and six months for further offenses against two other children, with the judge mandating that part of this sentence be served consecutively. Guider was placed under stringent protective measures in Goulburn Prison, yet he endured brutal assaults on two separate occasions, resulting in severe injuries, including fractures and lacerations. After accounting for time served before sentencing, he became eligible for parole in June 2014. However, his application was denied, extending his incarceration by approximately five years. Although he was again eligible for parole in June 2014, the State Parole Authority rejected his request, citing the necessity for comprehensive post-release plans. A subsequent review in April 2017 also resulted in denial, with another review scheduled for April 2018. By February 2019, reports indicated that Guider was legally due for release in June 2019, yet the Attorney General of New South Wales was actively seeking to prevent his release. The government sought an additional year of incarceration for Guider, a request that stirred significant public interest. Tess Knight, the mother of Knight, expressed her desire for Guider to remain imprisoned indefinitely, labelling him one of the most perilous offenders in New South Wales. On May 27, 2019, the government petitioned the Supreme Court of New South Wales for Guider's continued imprisonment, coupled with a five-year extended supervision order. The court was set to deliberate on whether to impose an interim detention or supervision order until a conclusive hearing anticipated in August. Guider's attorney contended that his client had demonstrated exemplary behavior as a prisoner, having been granted 20-day leaves under the watchful eye of a chaplain. He further asserted that, upon release, Guider would reside in a halfway house adjacent to Long Bay Prison, adhering to 56 conditions that would surpass the strictness of standard parole. On June 4th, the Supreme Court enacted an interim detention order, prolonging Guider's imprisonment for an additional 28 days, during which he would undergo evaluations by both a psychiatrist and a psychologist. By August 20th, Justice Richard Button announced that a decision regarding Guider's continued incarceration would be made by September 5th. Attorney General Mark Speakman aimed to extend Guider's imprisonment for another year, followed by five years of supervision post-release. Guider's counsel reiterated that, if released, his client would comply with the stringent conditions of the halfway house near Long Bay Prison. The court acknowledged that Guider had completed 55 therapeutic maintenance programs during his time in custody. On September 3rd, the judge ruled in favor of Guider's release, albeit under a multitude of restrictions. The Attorney General sought guidance on the feasibility of prolonging Guider's detention, yet he was ultimately released on September 5th subject to a five-year supervision order, a decision that garnered extensive media attention. Before his release, he was equipped with a Booty Insight Smart Tag. Upon his release, Guider was found to be suffering from a significant tumor in his groin. He had opted against treatment while incarcerated, harboring a deep mistrust of the prison's medical personnel. It was anticipated that the tumor would be evaluated following his release. Additionally, he was managing a heart condition with medication. During his time in prison, he had chosen not to take medication aimed at diminishing his sexual urges, fearing it would adversely affect his heart treatment. 
After his release, he spent a period in a halfway house near Long Bay before being relocated to a confidential site. Guider passed away at the Prince of Wales Hospital in Randwick on September 7, 2024, leaving behind the secret of Samantha Knight's burial site undisclosed. Mark Anthony Tildesley, born on August 31, 1976, was a charming seven-year-old English boy whose life took a tragic turn on June 1, 1984, when he vanished while visiting a fun fair in Wokingham, Berkshire. Despite extensive searches conducted by both local police and British Army personnel, no trace of him was found. Initially, Thames Valley police speculated that his remains might be interred near Wellington Road, close to the funfair from which he was taken. However, current beliefs suggest he may have been laid to rest in a shallow grave on desolate farmland. Mark was the youngest child of John and Lavinia Tildesley, with two older siblings who had already left their family residence at Rose Court in Wokingham. A student in Year 3 at Palmer C. of E. Junior School, he was eagerly anticipating the arrival of the Frank Ayres Fun Fair, which graced Carnival Field off Wellington Road four times a year. The fair coincided with his school's spring half-term holiday, which began on May 25, 1984. Although Mark was keen to attend, his modest weekly pocket money of 30 pence was insufficient. To supplement his funds, he diligently returned shopping trolleys to Tesco on Denmark Street, collecting the ten pence deposits left by customers. On that fateful afternoon, Mark encountered a man outside a sweet shop on Denmark Street, who generously offered him a fifty pence coin to purchase some sweets. The man promised to meet him later at the fun fair and offered to treat him to a ride on the Dodgems, Mark's favorite attraction. Shortly after 5.30 p.m., he set off on his bicycle for the half-mile journey to the fair, which was set to open at 6 p.m., assuring his family he would return by 7.30 p.m. Along the way, he crossed paths with two friends, but they opted to head home before joining him at the fair later that evening. Tildesley made his way to the fair alone, marking the last occasion his friends would see him alive. He was expected home by 7.30 p.m., but when the clock struck at 8 p.m., his parents, concerned by his absence, ventured to the fairgrounds in search of him. There they found his bicycle secured to the railings at the entrance. After returning home, Tildesley's mother reported him missing to the authorities at 10 p.m. The Thames Valley Police launched a comprehensive search of the Wokingham area, employing a helicopter and utilizing loudspeakers to appeal for information at the fairground, while also scouring nearby waterways. They even borrowed heat-seeking technology from the Metropolitan Police to assist in locating any potential remains. The day following Tildesley's disappearance, every worker and vendor at the fair was interrogated. Officers meticulously canvassed the 29 streets of Wokingham Town Centre, which housed 960 shops, businesses, and residences. During the weekend of June 9th to 10th, 1984, a formidable team comprising 15 police officers and two tracker dogs collaborated with 100 soldiers from the Royal Electrical and Mechanical Engineers Training Battalion based in Arborfield Garrison, to comb the southern expanse of Wokingham, from Barkham Road to Amon Corner, though their efforts yielded no results. Two weeks post-disappearance, Detective Superintendent Roger Nicklin lamented that the police remained utterly baffled regarding Mark's fate. In the wake of Tildesley's vanishing, several witnesses came forward, claiming to have seen a boy resembling him being forcibly taken from the fairground by a stooping man between 7 p.m. and 8 p.m. that fateful evening. Additional sightings were reported in the Langborough Road vicinity. A national poster campaign was initiated, with every police station across the country displaying Tildesley's image, and his disappearance garnered significant attention in both regional and national media. On June 7th, 
The mysterious vanishing of Tildesley was highlighted during the inaugural episode of the BBC's acclaimed series, Crime Watch UK. This initial appeal sparked an impressive response, with 400 calls flooding into the police from concerned citizens. The following day, the police produced their first video reconstruction, featuring a local seven-year-old boy clad in attire reminiscent of Tildesley's. As the first anniversary of Tildesley's disappearance approached, coinciding with the return of the Frank Ayers Fun Fair to Wokingham, a second reconstruction was filmed. This included scenes shot in various locations such as Rose Court, Rose Street, Broad Street, Denmark Street, the Carnival Field, and Loughborough Road. The footage was broadcast at 9.25 p.m. on June 13, 1985, during Crime Watch UK, resulting in an astonishing 1,000 calls, with information one of the highest response rates in the program's history. In total, the police received an overwhelming public reaction, with over 1,200 individuals providing 2,500 potential leads. The investigation was spearheaded by Detective Constable Jeff Gilbert, who had a personal connection to Tildesley through his mother's role at the Wokingham Police Station. From the outset, the Wokingham Police found themselves ill-equipped for such a significant undertaking, with only four officers assigned to the case due to staffing shortages caused by the ongoing miners' strike of 1984 to 1985. The cramped quarters of Wokingham Police Station necessitated the use of an attic storeroom as the incident office, while a mobile office was swiftly established at the fairground. Just two days post-disappearance, the police resorted to utilizing the Wokingham Baptist Church on Milton Road, adjacent to the police station, as a meeting space. As the investigation expanded over six weeks, the Thames Valley Police had to relocate the incident office to Solhampstead, near Reading. Additionally, the police needed to verify that Tildesley was indeed Lavinia Tildesley's son, rather than her sister Christina's child, due to the age differences among the siblings. D.C. Gilbert was called upon to undertake a task that Tildesley's mother deemed absurd, Initially, Tildesley's brother, Christopher, who had a disagreement with him on the very day he vanished, was the primary suspect, but he was quickly exonerated. On June 7, 1984, coinciding with the inaugural Crime Watch UK appeal, two anonymous tips emerged, suggesting that a particular fairground worker might be implicated in Tildesley's disappearance. This individual had been employed at the fair for 11 years and was present on the fateful night. He was apprehended and admitted to abducting Tildisley, claiming he had assaulted and murdered him in his nearby caravan. However, his numerous contradictory statements rendered his confession unreliable, leading detectives to conclude he was not the perpetrator. On August 16, 1984, the Metropolitan Police conducted an interview with another fairground worker, Sidney Cook, at his residence in London. A colleague of Cook had informed the detectives at the Tildesley Incident Office about his troubling behavior towards young boys in the past. When questioned about his whereabouts on the night of the disappearance, Cook asserted that he was working at a fair across from the West Hendon Police Station in London, a claim corroborated by the fair's owner. Consequently, while Cook remained on record, he was ruled out as a suspect. By October 1984, with the investigation yielding no new leads, Thames Valley Police began to scale back their efforts regarding Tildesley's case. In April 1987, media reports surfaced about potential connections to attempted abductions of young children in the Wokingham area over the preceding six months. The police explored whether these incidents could be related to Tildesley's disappearance, but this theory was ultimately dismissed. In 1989, the Metropolitan Police launched Operation Orchid, a comprehensive inquiry into the cases of missing children, spearheaded by Detective Chief Superintendent Roger Studley. In December 1990, as part of a significant investigation, authorities conducted an interview with the convicted pedophile Leslie Bailey, 
who was already implicated in two other murders, that of 14-year-old Jason Swift and 6-year-old Barry Lewis, both of which transpired after the mysterious disappearance of Tildesley. Investigators had come into possession of a letter and a hand-drawn map that Bailey had provided to a fellow inmate at H.M. Prison Wandsworth. This map indicated the location of Tildesley's murder, while the letter, penned by a cellmate, was directed to Cook, a member of the same pedophile ring as Bailey, who was also privy to the details of Tildesley's fate. At this juncture, Bailey, who had a mild learning disability, admitted that Cook's gang, infamously dubbed the Dirty Dozen by the police, had abducted, drugged, tortured, raped, and ultimately murdered Tildesley on the very night he vanished. It was during this revelation that law enforcement connected the stooping man to Cook. On the fateful night of Tildesley's disappearance, Bailey had been solicited by his partner in crime, Lenny Smith, to drive him from Hackney to Wokingham, where a gathering was set to take place in a caravan owned by Cook, situated near a fairground. Upon their arrival, Bailey parked on Langborough Road, and Smith ventured into the fun fair to locate Cook. They returned to the vehicle with a young boy, Tildesley, who was reluctant and had to be forcibly lifted into the back seat, despite being lured away from the fairground with the promise of a fifty-pence bag of sweets. With Bailey at the wheel and Smith in the front passenger seat, Cook restrained Tildesley in the rear. They subsequently met a fourth accomplice, a relative of Bailey known as Oddbald, at Cook's caravan, nestled in a field called the Moors, on Evenden's Lane, between Finchampstead and Barkham. Cook offered Tildesley a glass of milk laced with a muscle relaxant, of which the boy consumed only half, remarking that it tasted funny. The four men then proceeded to assault Tildesley, beginning with Cook and concluding with Smith. After administering additional muscle relaxants directly into the boy's throat, the perpetrators resumed their horrific actions. Smith forced a tablet into Tildesley's mouth and seized him by the throat, as the cycle of abuse dragged on for more than thirty minutes. It was during this time that Bailey realized the boy was no longer alive, although Cook insisted the child was merely unconscious and assured Bailey he would handle the situation. By the time Till Desley's parents discovered he was missing, it is likely he had already passed away. Following the murder, Bailey transported Smith back to Hackney, arriving shortly after midnight. Before parting ways at the marshes, Smith remarked that Cook would manage the disposal of the body. While the police received a judge's commendation for their relentless efforts in solving the case, they publicly acknowledged an unresolved facet. Tildesley's remains had never been recovered, leaving a somber void in the pursuit of closure. In 2007, Thames Valley Police established the dedicated review team to re-examine unsolved murders and serious sexual assaults spanning the past five decades, including the tragic case of Tildesley. Despite this renewed effort, no significant breakthroughs emerged. Tildesley is believed to be the first known murder victim of the Dirty Dozen ring. However, in 2015, mounting media and political pressure led to the reopening of an investigation into the 1981 murder of seven-year-old Vishal Mehrotra near East Putney Tube Station in London, with the gang being scrutinized for their potential involvement in this earlier crime. In 2015, Studley voiced concerns of a potential cover-up by the Metropolitan Police, arguing there was enough evidence to prosecute Cook for Tildesley's killing. On October 18, 1991, Bailey, along with persons unknown, faced charges for the murder. The trial itself was highly unusual, as the judge explicitly named Cook and Smith as perpetrators, even though they were not formally charged. Equally unprecedented was Bailey's directive to his defense barrister to seek the maximum sentence possible, expressing frustration that Cook and Smith were not also being held accountable. On October 22, 1992, 
Bailey pleaded guilty to manslaughter and one charge of buggery, receiving two life sentences on December 9th of that year. Following the verdict, Tildesley's mother called for the reinstatement of the death penalty, declaring he should have been hanged. Bailey maintained that he did not know the whereabouts of Tildesley's body. Cook, on the other hand, has hinted at knowing the burial location but has refused to disclose it to authorities or the boy's family. Despite Bailey's confession, a police excavation of the Moors in March 1991 yielded no findings. Subsequent refusals by police in 1998 to reinterrogate Cook or search a nearby golf course left the family in anguish. In 2012, a fragment of a human skull found near Evendun's Lane was determined not to belong to Tildesley. To this day, Tildesley's remains remain undiscovered, making his murder one of Wokingham's most infamous cases. Initial police theories placed his body within a mile of the fairground where he was abducted, but current beliefs suggest he lies in a shallow grave on deserted farmland. In 2019, the family issued a final, desperate plea for Cook, now in his 90s, to reveal the location of the boy's body, yet no resolution has been found.